The Jewel of Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. Chapter Ten: The Valley of the Sorcerer. I placed the book on the little table in which the shaded lamp rested and moved the screen to one side. Thus I could have the light on my book, and by looking up see the bed and the nurse and the door. I cannot say that the conditions were enjoyable or calculated to allow of that absorption in the subject which is advisable for effective study. However, I composed myself to the work as well as I could. The book was one which, on the very face of it, required special attention. It was a folio in Dutch, printed in Amsterdam in 1650. Someone had made a literal translation, writing generally the English word under the Dutch, so that the grammatical differences between the two tongues made even the reading of the translation a difficult matter. One had to dodge backward and forward among the words. This was in addition to the difficulty of deciphering a strange handwriting of two hundred years ago. I found, however, that after a short time I got into the habit of following in conventional English the Dutch construction, and as I became more familiar with the writing, my task became easier. At first the circumstances of the room, and the fear lest Miss Trelawney should return unexpectedly and find me reading the book, disturbed me somewhat for we had arranged amongst us, before Dr. Winchester had gone home, that she was not to be brought into the range of the coming investigation. We considered that there might be some shock to a woman's mind in matters of apparent mystery, and further that she, being Mr. Trelawney's daughter, might be placed in a difficult position with him afterward if she took part in, or even had a personal knowledge of, the disregarding of his expressed wishes. But when I remembered that she did not come on nursing duty till two o'clock, the fear of interruption passed away. I had still nearly three hours before me. Nurse Kennedy sat in her chair by the bedside, patient and alert. A clock ticked on the landing. Other clocks in the house ticked. The life of the city without manifested itself in the distant hum, now and again swelling into a roar as a breeze floating westward took the concourse of sounds with it. But still the dominant idea was of silence. The light on my book and the soothing fringe of green silk round the shade intensified, whenever I looked up, the gloom of the sick room. With every line I read, this seemed to grow deeper and deeper, so that when my eyes came back to the page, the light seemed to dazzle me. I stuck to my work, however, and presently began to get sufficiently into the subject to become interested in it. The book was by one Nicholas Van Hein of Hearn. In the preface, he told how, attracted by the work of John Greaves of Merton College, Pyramidographia, he himself visited Egypt, where he became so interested in its wonders that he devoted some years of his life to visiting strange places and exploring the ruins of many temples and tombs. He had come across many variants of the story of the building of the pyramids as told by the Arabian historian Ibn Abd al-Kolin, some of which he set down. These I did not stop to read, but went on to the marked pages. As soon as I began to read these, however, there grew on me some sense of a disturbing influence. Once or twice I looked to see if the nurse had moved, for there was a feeling as though someone were near me. Nurse Kennedy sat in her place, as steady and alert as ever, and I came back to my book again. The narrative went on to tell how, after passing for several days through the mountains to the east of Aswan, the explorer came to a certain place. Here I give his own words, simply putting the translation into modern English. Toward evening we came to the entrance of a narrow, deep valley running east and west. 
I wished to proceed through this, for the sun, now nearly down on the horizon, showed a wide opening beyond the narrowing of the cliffs. But the Fellaheen absolutely refused to enter the valley at such a time, alleging that they might be caught by the night before they could emerge from the other end. At first they would give no reason for their fear. They had hitherto gone anywhere I wished, and at any time, without demur. On being pressed, however, they said that the place was the Valley of the Sorcerer, where none might come in the night. On being asked to tell of the Sorcerer, they refused, saying that there was no name, and that they knew nothing. On the next morning, however, when the sun was up and shining down the valley, their fears had somewhat passed away. Then they told me that a great sorcerer in ancient days, millions of millions of years was the term they used, a king or a queen, they could not say which, was buried there. They could not give the name, persisting to the last that there was no name, and that anyone who should name it would waste away in life so that at death nothing of him would remain to be raised again in the other world. In passing through the valley, they kept together in a cluster, hurrying on in front of me. None dared to remain behind. They gave, as their reason for so proceeding, that the arms of the sorcerer were long, and that it was dangerous to be the last. The which was of little comfort to me who of this necessity took that honorable post. In the narrowest part of the valley, on the south side, was a great cliff of rock, rising sheer, of smooth and even surface. Hereon were graven certain cabalistic signs, and many figures of men and animals, fishes, reptiles and birds, suns and stars, and many quaint symbols. Some of these latter were disjointed limbs and features, such as arms and legs, fingers, eyes, noses, ears, and lips. Mysterious symbols which will puzzle the recording angel to interpret at the judgment day. The cliff faced exactly north. There was something about it so strange, and so different from the other carved rocks which I had visited, that I called a halt and spent the day in examining the rock front as well as I could with my telescope. The Egyptians of my company were terribly afraid, and used every kind of persuasion to induce me to pass on. I stayed till late in the afternoon, by which time I had failed to make out aright the entry of any tomb, for I suspected that such was the purpose of the sculpture of the rock. By this time the men were rebellious, and I had to leave the valley if I did not wish my whole retinue to desert. But I secretly made up my mind to discover the tomb and explore it. To this end I went further into the mountains, where I met with an Arab sheikh who was willing to take service with me. The Arabs were not bound by the same superstitious fears as the Egyptians. Sheikh Abu Some and his following were willing to take a part in the explorations. When I returned to the valley with these Bedouins, I made effort to climb the face of the rock, but failed, it being of one impenetrable smoothness. The stone, generally flat and smooth by nature, had been chiseled to completeness. That there had been projecting steps was manifest, for there remained, untouched by the wondrous climate of that strange land, the marks of saw and chisel and mallet where the steps had been cut or broken away. Being thus baffled of winning the tomb from below, and being unprovided with ladders to scale, I found a way by much circuitous journeying to the top of the cliff. Thence I caused myself to be lowered by ropes till I had investigated that portion of the rock face wherein I expected to find the opening. I found that there was an entrance, closed, however, by a great stone slab. 
This was cut in the rock more than a hundred feet up, being two-thirds the height of the cliff. The hieroglyphic and cabalistic symbols cut in the rock were so managed as to disguise it. The cutting was deep and was continued through the rock and the portals of the doorway and through the great slab which formed the door itself. This was fixed in place with such incredible exactness that no stone chisel or cutting implement which I had with me could find a lodgment in the interstices. I used much force, however, and by many heavy strokes won away into the tomb, for such I found it to be. The stone door, having fallen into the entrance, I passed over it into the tomb, noting as I went a long iron chain which hung coiled on a bracket close to the doorway. The tomb I found to be complete, after the manner of the finest Egyptian tombs, with chamber and shaft leading down to the corridor, ending in the mummy pit. It had the table of pictures, which seems some kind of record, whose meaning is now forever lost, graven in a wondrous color on a wondrous stone. All the walls of the chamber and the passage were carved with strange writings in the uncanny form mentioned. The huge stone coffin or sarcophagus in the deep pit was marvelously graven throughout with signs. The Arab chief and two others who ventured into the tomb with me, and who were evidently used to such grim explorations, managed to take the cover from the sarcophagus without breaking it, at which they wondered, for such good fortune, they said, did not usually attend such efforts. Indeed, they seemed not over-careful, and did handle the various furniture of the tomb with such little concern that, only for its great strength and thickness, even the coffin itself might have been injured. Which gave me much concern, for it was very beautifully wrought of rare stone, such as I had no knowledge of. Much I grieved that it were not possible to carry it away but time and desert journeyings forbade such. I could only take with me such small matters as could be carried on the person. Within the sarcophagus was a body, manifestly of a woman, swathed with many wrappings of linen, as is usual with all mummies. From certain embroiderings thereon, I gathered that she was of high rank, Across the breast was one hand, unwrapped. In the mummies which I had seen, the arms and hands are within the wrappings, and certain adornments of wood, shaped and painted to resemble arms and hands, lie outside the unwrapped body. But this hand was strange to see, for it was the real hand of her who lay unwrapped there, the arm projecting from the searments being of flesh, seemingly made as like marble in the process of embalming. Arm and hand were of dusky white, being of the hue of ivory that hath lain long in air. The skin and the nails were complete and whole, as though the body had been placed for burial overnight. I touched the hand and moved it, the arm being something flexible as a live arm, though stiff with long disuse, as are the arms of those fakirs which I have seen in the Indies. There was, too, an added wonder that on this ancient hand were no less than seven fingers, the same all being fine and long and of great beauty. Sooth to say, it made me shudder and my flesh creep to touch that hand that had lain there undisturbed for so many thousands of years, and yet was like unto living flesh. Underneath the hand, as though guarded by it, lay a huge jewel of ruby, a great stone of wondrous bigness, for the ruby is in the main a small jewel. This one of wondrous color, being as of fine blood whereon the light shineth. But its wonder lay not in its size or color, though these were, as I have said, of priceless rarity, 
but in that the light of it shone from seven stars, each of seven points, as clearly as though the stars were in reality there imprisoned. When that the hand was lifted, the sight of that wondrous stone lying there struck me with a shock almost to momentary paralysis. I stood gazing on it, as did those with me, as though it were that faded head of the Gorgon Medusa with the snakes in her hair, whose sight struck into stone those who beheld. So strong was the feeling that I wanted to hurry away from the place. So, too, those with me. Therefore, taking this rare jewel, together with certain amulets of strangeness and richness, being wrought of jewel stones, I made haste to depart. I would have remained longer and made further research in the wrappings of the mummy, but that I feared so to do. For it came to me all at once that I was in a desert place, with strange men who were with me because they were not over-scrupulous that we were in a lone cavern of the dead, a hundred feet above the ground, where none could find me were ill done to me, nor would any ever seek. But in secret I determined that I would come again, though with more secure following. Moreover, was I tempted to seek further, as in examining the wrappings I saw many things of strange import in that wondrous tomb including a casket of eccentric shape made of some strange stone, which, methought, might have contained other jewels, inasmuch as it had secure lodgment in the great sarcophagus itself. There was in the tomb also another coffer, which, though of rare proportion and adornment, was more simply shaped. It was of ironstone of great thickness, but the cover was lightly cemented down with what seemed gum and Paris plaster, as though to ensure that no air could penetrate. The Arabs with me so insisted in its opening, thinking that from its thickness much treasure was stored therein, that I consented thereto. But their hope was a false one, as it proved. Within, closely packed, stood four jars finely wrought and carved with various adornments. Of these, one was the head of a man, another of a dog, another of a jackal, and another of a hawk. I had before known that such burial urns as these were used to contain the entrails and other organs of the mummied dead, but on opening these, for the fastening of wax, though complete, was thin and yielded easily, we found that they held but oil. The Bedouins, spilling out most of the oil in the process, groped with their hands in the jars lest treasure should have been there concealed. But their searching was of no avail, no treasure was there. I was warned of my danger, by seeing in the eyes of the Arabs certain covetous glances, whereon, in order to hasten their departure, I wrought upon those fears of superstition which even in these callous men were apparent. The chief of the Bedouins ascended from the pit to give the signal to those above to raise us, and I, not caring to remain with the men whom I mistrusted, followed him immediately. The others did not come at once, from which I feared that they were rifling the tomb afresh on their own account. I refrained to speak of it, however, lest worse should befall. At last they came. One of them, who ascended first, in landing at the top of the cliff, lost his foothold and fell below. He was instantly killed. The other followed but in safety. The chief came next, and I came last. Before coming away, I pulled into its place again, as well as I could, the slab of stone that covered the entrance to the tomb. I wished, if possible, to preserve it for my own examination should I come again. When we all stood on the hill above the cliff, 
the burning sun that was bright and full of glory was good to see after the darkness and strange mystery of the tomb. Even was I glad that the poor Arab who fell down the cliff and lay dead below lay in the sunlight and not in that gloomy cavern. I would fain have gone with my companions to seek him and give him sepulture of some kind, but the sheik made light of it and sent two of his men to see to it whilst we went on our way. That night as we camped, one of the men only returned, saying that a lion in the desert had killed his companion. After that they had buried the dead man in a deep sand without the valley, and had covered the spot where he lay with many great rocks, so that jackals or other praying beasts might not dig him up again, as is their wont. Later, in the light of the fire round which the men sat or lay, I saw him exhibit to his fellows something white which they seemed to regard with special awe and reverence. So I drew near, silently, and saw that it was none other than the white hand of the mummy which had lain protecting the jewel in the great sarcophagus. I heard the Bedouin tell how he had found it on the body of him who had fallen from the cliff. There was no mistaking it, for there were the seven fingers which I had noted before. This man must have wrenched it off the dead body whilst his chief and I were otherwise engaged and from the awe of the others I doubted not that he had hoped to use it as an amulet or charm. Whereas, if powers it had, they were not for him who had taken it from the dead, since his death followed hard upon his theft. Already his amulet had had an awesome baptism, for the wrist of the dead hand was stained with red, as though it had been dipped in recent blood. That night I was in certain fear lest there should be some violence done to me, for if the poor dead hand was so valued as a charm, what must be the worth in such wise of the rare jewel which it had guarded? Though only the chief knew of it, my doubt was perhaps even greater for he could so order matters as to have me at his mercy when he would. I guarded myself, therefore, with wakefulness so well as I could, determined that at my earliest opportunity I should leave this party and complete my journeying home, first to the Nile bank and then down its course to Alexandria, with other guides who knew not what strange matters I had with me. At last there came over me a disposition of sleep, so potent that I felt it would be resistless. Fearing attack, or that being searched in my sleep, the Bedouin might find the star jewel which he had seen me place with others in my dress, I took it out unobserved and held it in my hand. It seemed to give back the light of the flickering fire and the light of the stars, for there was no moon, with equal fidelity, and I could note that on its reverse it was graven deeply with certain signs such as I had seen in the tomb. As I sank into the unconsciousness of sleep, the graven star jewel was hidden in the hollow of my clenched hand. I waked out of sleep with the light of the morning sun on my face. I sat up and looked around me. The fire was out, and the camp was desolate, save for one figure which lay prone close to me. It was that of the Arab chief, who lay on his back, dead. His face was almost black, and his eyes were open and staring horribly up at the sky, as though he saw there some dreadful vision. He had evidently been strangled, for on looking I found on his throat the red marks where fingers had pressed. There seemed so many of these marks that I counted them. There were seven, and all parallel, except the thumb mark, as though made with one hand. This thrilled me as I thought of the mummy hand with the seven fingers. Even there, in the open desert, it seemed as if there could be enchantments. 
In my surprise, as I bent over him, I opened my right hand, which up to now I had held shut with the feeling, instinctive even in sleep, of keeping safe that which it held. As I did so, the star jewel held there fell out and struck the dead man on the mouth. Mirabile dictu there came forth at once from the dead mouth a great gush of blood, in which the red jewel was for the moment lost. I turned the dead man over to look for it, and found that he lay with his right hand bent under him as though he had fallen on it, and in it he held a great knife, keen of point and edge, such as Arabs carry at the belt. It may have been that he was about to murder me when vengeance came on him, whether from man or God, or the gods of old, I know not. Suffice it that when I found my ruby jewel, which shone up as a living star from the mess of blood wherein it lay, I paused not, but fled from the place. I journeyed on alone through the hot desert, till, by God's grace, I came upon an Arab tribe camping by a well, who gave me salt. With them I rested till they had set me on my way. I know not what became of the mummy hand, or of those who had it. What strife, or suspicion, or disaster, or greed went with it, I know not but some such cause there must have been, since those who had it fled with it. It doubtless is used as a charm of potence by some desert tribe. At the earliest opportunity I made examination of the star ruby, as I wished to try to understand what was graven on it. The symbols, whose meaning, however, I could not understand, were as follows. Twice, whilst I had been reading this engrossing narrative, I thought that I had seen across the page streaks of shade, which the weirdness of the subject had made to seem like the shadow of a hand. On the first of these occasions I found that the illusion came from the fringe of green silk around the lamp. But on the second I had looked up, and my eyes had lit on the mummy hand across the room on which the starlight was falling under the edge of the blind. It was of little wonder that I had connected it with such a narrative, for if my eyes told me truly, here, in this room with me, was the very hand of which the traveller Van Hyn had written. I looked over at the bed, and it comforted me to think that the nurse still sat there calm and wakeful. At such a time, with such surrounds, during such a narrative, it was well to have assurance of the presence of some living person. I sat looking at the book on the table before me, and so many strange thoughts crowded on me that my mind began to whirl. It was almost as if the light on the white fingers in front of me was beginning to have some hypnotic effect. All at once, all thoughts seemed to stop, and for an instant the world and time stood still. There lay a real hand across the book. What was there to so overcome me, as was the case? I knew the hand that I saw in the book, and loved it. Margaret Trelawney's hand was a joy to me to see, to touch, and yet, at that moment, Coming after other marvelous things, it had a strangely moving effect on me. It was but momentary, however, and had passed even before her voice had reached me. "'What disturbs you? What are you staring at the book for? I thought for an instant that you must have been overcome again.' I jumped up. "'I was reading,' I said, "'an old book from the library.' As I spoke, I closed it and put it under my arm. "'I shall now put it back, as I understand that your father wishes all things, especially books, kept in their proper places.' My words were intentionally misleading, for I did not wish her to know what I was reading, and thought it best not to wake her curiosity by leaving the book about. 
I went away, but not to the library. I left my book in my room, where I could get it when I had had my sleep in the day. When I returned, Nurse Kennedy was ready to go to bed, so Miss Trelawney watched with me in the room. I did not want any book whilst she was present. We sat close together and talked in a whisper whilst the moments flew by. It was with surprise that I noted the edge of the curtains changing from gray to yellow light. What we talked of had nothing to do with the sick man, except in so far that all which concerned his daughter must ultimately concern him, but it had nothing to say to Egypt or mummies or the dead or caves or Bedouin chiefs. I could well take note in the growing light that Margaret's hand had not seven fingers, but five, for it lay in mine. When Dr. Winchester arrived in the morning and had made his visit to his patient, he came to see me as I sat in the dining-room having a little meal, breakfast or supper, I hardly knew which it was, before I went to lie down. Mr. Corbeck came in at the same time, and we resumed our conversation where we had left it the night before. I told Mr. Corbeck that I had read the chapter about the finding of the tomb, and that I thought Dr. Winchester should read it too. The latter said that, if he might, he would take it with him. He had that morning to make a railway journey to Ipswich, and would read it on the train. He said he would bring it back with him when he came again in the evening. I went up to my room to bring it down, but I could not find it anywhere. I had a distinct recollection of having left it on the little table beside my bed when I had come up after Miss Trelawney's going on duty into the sick room. It was very strange, for the book was not of a kind that any of the servants would be likely to take. I had to come back and explain to the others that I could not find it. When Dr. Winchester had gone, Mr. Corbeck, who seemed to know the Dutchman's work by heart, talked the whole matter over with me. I told him that I was interrupted by a change of nurses, just as I had come to the description of the ring. He smiled as he said, "'So far as that is concerned, you need not be disappointed. Not in Van Hine's time, nor for nearly two centuries later, could the meaning of that engraving have been understood. It was only when the work was taken up and followed by Young and Champollion, by Birch and Lepsius and Rossellini and Salvolini, by Mariette Bay and by Wallace Budge and Flinders Petrie and the other scholars of their times that great results ensued, and that the true meaning of hieroglyphic was known. Later I shall explain to you if Mr. Trelawney does not explain it himself, or if he does not forbid me to, what it means in that particular place. I think it will be better for you to know what followed Van Hine's narrative, for with the description of the stone, and the accounts of his bringing it to Holland at the termination of his travels, the episode ends. Ends, so far as his book is concerned, the chief thing about the book is that it sets others thinking and acting. Amongst them were Mr. Trelawney and myself. Mr. Trelawney is a good linguist of the Orient, but he does not know northern tongues. As for me, I have a faculty for learning languages, and when I was pursuing my studies in Leyden, I learned Dutch so that I might more easily make references in the library there. Thus it was that, at the very time when Mr. Trelawney, who, in making his great collection of works on Egypt, had, through a bookseller's catalogue, acquired this volume with the manuscript translation, was studying it, I was reading another copy, in original Dutch, in Leyden. We were both struck by the description of the lonely tomb in the rock, cut so high up as to be inaccessible to ordinary seekers, with all means of reaching it carefully obliterated, and yet with such an elaborate ornamentation of the smooth surface of the cliff as Van Hine has described. 
It also struck us both as an odd thing, for in the years between Van Hyn's time and our own, the general knowledge of Egyptian curios and records has increased marvelously, that in the case of such a tomb, made in such a place, and which must have cost an immense sum of money, there was no seeming record or effigy to point out who lay within. Moreover, the very name of the place, the Valley of the Sorcerer, had in a prosaic age attractions of its own. When we met, which we did through his seeking the assistance of other Egyptologists in his work, we talked over this, as we did over many other things, and we determined to make search for the mysterious valley. Whilst we were waiting to start on the travel, for many things were required which Mr. Trelawney undertook to see to himself, I went to Holland to try if I could by any traces verify Van Hyn's narrative. I went straight to Hearn, and set patiently to work to find the house of the traveler and his descendants, if any. I need not trouble you with details of my seeking and finding. Hearn is a place that has not changed much since Van Hyn's time, except that it has lost the place which it held amongst commercial cities. Its externals are such as they had been then. In such a sleepy old place, a century or two does not count for much. I found the house, and discovered that none of the descendants were alive. I searched records, but only to one end, death and extinction. Then I set me to work to find what had become of his treasures, for that such a traveler must have had great treasures was apparent. I traced a good many to museums in Leiden, Utrecht, and Amsterdam, and some few to the private houses of rich collectors. At last, in the shop of an old watchmaker and jeweler at Hearn, I found what he considered his chiefest treasure, a great ruby, carven like a scarab, with seven stars, and engraven with hieroglyphics. The old man did not know hieroglyphic character, and in his old-world, sleepy life the philological discoveries of recent years had not reached him. He did not know anything of Van Hyn, except that such a person who had been, and that his name was, during two centuries venerated in the town as a great traveler. He valued the jewel as only a rare stone, spoiled in part by the cutting, and though he was at first loath to part with such a unique gem, he became amenable ultimately to commercial reason. I had a full purse, since I bought for Mr. Trelawney, who is, as I suppose you know, immensely wealthy. I was shortly on my way back to London, with the star ruby safe in my pocket-book, and in my heart a joy and exultation which knew no bounds. For here we were with proof of Van Hyn's wonderful story. The jewel was put in security in Mr. Trelawney's great safe, and we started out on our journey of exploration in full hope. Mr. Trelawney was, at the last, loath to leave his young wife, whom he dearly loved, but she, who loved him equally, knew his longing to prosecute the search. So keeping to herself, as all good women do, all her anxieties, which in her case were special, she bade him follow out his bent. End of chapter 10 Recording by Roger Moline